Dear Creator, I give thanks and celebrate our connection and the divine spark that resides within me. Today I give instructions to that magnificent part of me to push the energy of positive expectations and benevolence into my future. I trust in my angelic self to always bring me the solutions and synchronicities I need. I allow myself to receive the infinite love and blessings the Creator has for me. Dear Creator, I give thanks and celebrate our connection and the divine spark that resides within me. Today, I give instructions to that magnificent part of me to push the energy of positive expectation and benevolence into my future. I trust in my angelic self to always bring me the solutions and synchronicities I need. I allow myself to receive the infinite love and blessings the Creator has for me. Well, I hope all of you feel the power within these wonderful affirmation statements. You are sacred and blessed and loved unconditionally by spirit. Hmm. We're going to say these same affirmations again at the beginning of each program for the rest of this month. And for our members, they can find all of the past affirmations as well that we've given in their membership portal. So we'd like to now take the questions that have been submitted by our members. And this question comes from Renata. And Renata is in Surrey in the UK. And she's asking about wealth and money. So here's Renata's question. Very often when I see extreme wealth, luxury, millionaires and billionaires, I always have an almost repulsive feeling towards it. I think this is excessive and bad. What about kids starving around the world? And similar thoughts about inequality. Someone I know said that this is a limiting belief and that if I keep projecting this negative feeling to wealth, I will never achieve abundance myself. I don't need millions, but I would definitely like to have more abundance in my life. What does Cryon say about limiting beliefs in relation to money? Renata, this is really a great question. We might spend some time on this. It's maybe the only question today, just because I want to go slow and, and do it right. I think it's an issue. I think it's an issue with many of us. So we all face something like this, and it's about the perception of what we were told and what we think is universally fair and unfair. Krein has always said, and I like to start with the Krein quotes, you don't know what you don't know. Never assume you do and then make judgments around it. And then the obvious from Krein, which might answer one of your questions, and a part of your question, maybe the last part, if you believe you can never have money for whatever reason, then you won't. That's how powerful your thought is. This money issue extends to so many areas as well. Even the public platform we're now presenting on regarding the commercialization, monetization, it's, it's, it's YouTube. It's also especially sensitive with spiritual workers who need money to actually do, do, do the work that they do, but they don't feel they can charge anything. I would like to get very personal and talk about these things in my culture that nobody is supposed to talk about, the money we all earn. It's almost a taboo to talk about it. I'll start by telling you a story. Like so many in my culture, I started attending church as a child. That's when I learned a scripture that was given by Jesus in the book of Matthew. Now it's Matthew 19, and I'll quote it. It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of God. Hmm. So, of course, this became the essence we all learned, if you came from a background I did, if you read any scripture, to be poor is, is, is worthy and godly, and to have money is to be unenlightened and bad. That's what we, I learned it that way. I mean, what else could it mean, really? 
Immediately, I promise you that this is at the core of how you and many others feel because it's almost a planetary religious teaching and perception. It seems that we all learn that being poor and struggling is good and having money is bad. After all, scripture said so. There are some religious groups who actually flog themselves and harm themselves in order to be worthy. We also learn that church is free, so why should anyone anywhere pay for anything spiritual? <laughs> I want to tell you a story. As a child, I saw something that bothered me. There was a man and a woman at my church who always came in a very expensive car. So expensive, they parked it in a special place next to the pastors. <laughs> Everyone knew that they were extremely wealthy and that they were, they were always there. They sat in the front row every Sunday. They got a bit older. I finally asked my Sunday school teacher about them. It was a dichotomy to me. And I said, they were rich. And, and if you believe the scripture, that they're not going to go to heaven. So why were they even there? And why were enlightened rich people allowed in the front row? That's the kid speaking to my teacher. My teacher paused, and I'll never forget what he told me. Lee, look around you. Who paid for this building you're in, where you're able to come and be comfortable and, and worship freely? Who pays the many expenses here? Who pays for the repairs and the upkeep? Who pays for the pastor of this church and his family to have food and live in that house they're in? Do you think he has an extra job somewhere else that pays for that? Then he told me this. God has blessed these people in the front row with wealth, and they know it. God has given them everything they have, and they know it. He lowered his voice. This is confidential, Lee, but that is the couple who paid for the big renovation of this church building last year. Do you remember that construction mess we had for months? Oh, yeah, I did. I remembered it. It was awful. It was an awful mess. They paid for all that work, just the two of them? It was an amazing remodel of this entire facility. He answered, yes, Lee, they paid for all of it. And a lot of other things over the years that nobody knows about. They are blessed, and they regularly share it with the church. We need them. I challenged him right away. Teacher, I thought that when we passed the plate for contributions on Sunday morning, it paid for everything here. He smiled. Lee, when you get a little bit older, you're going to put this together. The few dollars collected on Sunday barely pay for the lights to be turned on. Every church you see, Lee, depends a bit on the wealthy to pay their bills and build new facilities. That's when I first started to realize that there was probably a great deal more to the perception of the camel and the eye of the needle than I was ever given, that I ever thought. Was that even correct? This program you're watching is created in a professional television studio with a hefty price tag. It puts technicians to work as well. Someone has to pay for that, that operation. It isn't free. Yet you are all receiving it for free. How do you think that happens? <laughs> I created a program that we sell subscriptions for, and it's called Healing Wednesday, and it's the program you are currently watching. The subscription price is low, as low as I could make it and still pay for all this that you're seeing and make a living for myself and Monica. The subscription fees altogether are like a rich person. And they fund an experience for those who may not have the few dollars it takes to subscribe. Are you getting this? The formula for this was given to me by Cryon. Quote from Cryon, make the programs exactly as I tell you and give away 25% of them. So there will be those without the funds to subscribe who can be blessed by it also. Don't you love it? So when we see the very rich, how do we know this is not the case for them? How do we know? that they're not also funding things for others. We don't. We just see them and assume they're not helping anybody. Indeed, I have had those thoughts. I've, I, I really have. 
But then I've also had those who contribute to my work, even though there's no avenue to do that. We don't ask for money. You've never seen it. But it occasionally comes in anyway, usually from wealthy people. And it always comes in exactly when we need it. Cryon Book One was completely funded by a wealthy person at the last minute. And every wealthy person who has ever done this, who has ever helped us, asks never to be identified as a contributor to my work. Instead, there is a wish to be silent, to be a silent contributor and allow good things for the rest of us. Later in the program, we'll do a section called Miracle Moments, where we share heartwarming stories about healing and victory over life's issues. That's what this program was designed for. That's the only thing this program was designed for. And those miracles and healings and victories over grief and sadness and sorrow all came from this studio, funded by those who are not poor and destitute and maybe couldn't even get through the eye of the needle. Hmm. I had to reframe my perceptions of those with a great deal of money and wealth. <sighs> I have to hold my tongue sometimes about those I know who are generous and giving them compassion and they're rich because they told me not to say anything. Perhaps everything is not as it seems. I think it's about compassionate reframing of everything you see around you and an allowance for what you don't know. I celebrate those with money and the awakening they are having now, especially of compassion and purpose. We need them. What a beautiful answer, Lee. Reframing, compassionate mm -hmm. action, and allowance. So let's move into a meditation. And let's be inspired by those words of reframing of the things we don't know and giving allowance. So I invite you to close your eyes. And let us make a statement, dear spirit, I affirm that there are things I do not know anything about. Help me to change my perception on things that I don't know anything about. Help me to release judgment on the things I do not know about. Dear Spirit, I invite the energy of allowance for positive expectations and benevolence. Dear Spirit, show me how this can be achieved. Greetings, dear ones. I am Cryon of Magnetic Service. Is it possible? for anyone to tell the future, anyone. Can it be done? This and other subjects about the future are what the series will be about this month. I'll give you four channelings that talk about things of the past, the future, the present, and that whole issue of time. What it could mean? Is it possible? Is time really something that exists? Can you move forward into it and tell what's going to happen? Can anybody give you that? So the subject of this first channel is exactly from that question. Is it possible to tell the future? I have given information for so long about the free will of humanity, about the, the linear aspect of time that says that anything can be changed at any time through the consciousness of humanity. That if, huma if, if humans have total and complete free choice on what they do, and whether they go to the light or don't, or, or if they awaken or don't, if, if, if cultures change, if that's the case, how could anyone go to any place they call a vision and come back with what's going to happen? Because humans can change it. They can change it tomorrow. 
That's a puzzle. So again we ask, is it possible for anyone truly to give you the future? The answer may be complex, but I also want to make it clear. If you go back in time, <laughs> there it is again, you'll find that shamans of old often told those around them about what might happen. And then it did. There have been those in your cultures and your societies that might have done the same thing. Some of them accurately and some of them not. And some of them what you might call hit and miss. Were they simply lucky or is there an avenue that someone might take that actually might give them good answers about the future? Let me ask you this. If you go to visit the Hopi Indian rock and you see scratched into the surface lightly a complete description of what is happening right now, how did they do that? It would, it would really seem that this ancient rock was them giving a future way far away from anything they even knew about that is happening right this moment. If you talk to some of the other indigenous cultures about their cosmology, they will describe the shift we are in. Now, how did that happen? How are they then giving the future? Because they did. And the funny thing, the peculiar thing, is this, that so many of them gave the same story. And they never even met each other. This would seem that there are those who can tell the future. How does that work? In order to explain this better, I would like to bring it into modern day. There is a gentleman who didn't start out to be metaphysical, but became that way because of the visions he had. His last name was Scallion. And the gentleman had powerful visions that were given to him about the future. And when he had the visions, they were so real to him that he came back and told his followers or anyone who wanted to, to know what he had seen. So profound was it that he, he gave a map of the future that was popular for some time. But it wasn't a pretty map at all. It showed much of the United States underwater. Something was going to happen, either natural or not, that would create earthquakes, would create turmoil. There were many who believed him, moved away from the West Coast. And that it didn't happen. You see, he assigned dates to it. This first happened in the late 80s into the early 90s. And when the dates did not produce that which he had seen, he would go out again supposedly to, to generate another vision, although I think they came pretty naturally to him. And he saw it a little, a little differently, but, but it was still going to happen in a certain way. So vividly was he, was he seeing this, he came back and, and even altered his map. He gave a date and it didn't happen. He became wise in this and he realized something. Was I seeing the future or was I seeing a future? There is a difference. What if what you've heard about time is true? That in a multidimensional state, you are always in the past, the present and the future. And if that's the case, and time is giving to you in a, in a very linear form when it's actually a multidimensional thing, it kind of messes up the thoughts you have about everything, about the past, the future, the present. 
Can you get into the now and tell the future because of it? And that may be the secret. What if there were many futures? Because of this possibility, maybe there were many timelines, but you're only on one. So here is the question again. Can you tell the future that is coming for you? And the answer is, at some level, yes. And I'm going to show you how. I'll tell you how. It is all wrapped up in what is happening now. Based upon what is happening now, what might happen next? And how does it relate to the visions of the indigenous? That will give you a far grander, greater idea of what's happening on this planet than anything else. There are many who will continue to go out and have visions and come back with catastrophe and horror. And you can look at it and go, well, that's, that's the future you saw because you're on some timeline of your own. That's not necessarily the future being developed from what's happening right now. So again, I give you the metaphor so you will understand how somebody could possibly tell the future, including the indigenous. And here's how it works. Consciousness is energy. And if you imagine the consciousness and the attitude of this consciousness, the attributes of it, is it dark consciousness? Is it light consciousness? What is it? Imagine it starting to develop into a huge ball, like, for instance, a snowball. And it starts to, to roll slowly down the hill of a snow-covered bank on its way in time. Perhaps it's not going to get where it's going for a generation, but it begins. And as it goes down, how do you see it? Does it collect more of its own energy? For instance, the energy of enlightenment, kindness, compassion is the snowball that I told you about in 1989. That's the snowball. The book was called The End Times because The End Times was the collection of that snowball. That snowball would bring you to a place where there would be no World War III. And I told you that in 1989. I published it in 1993. There would be no Armageddon. There would be no World War III. And you didn't get it at the appointed time in the year 2000, did you? The snowball rolls down the hill, becomes bigger, and pretty soon you can look in front of it because of the elements of gravity, and you can see where it's going. This snowball is going to roll down this hill and it's going to dispense the energy when it lands, wherever it lands. And you can't stop it. Is that telling the future? If you saw a real snowball rolling down the hill, would everybody be amazed if you said, it's going to go over there? <laughs> and the answer is, nobody would be amazed. <laughs> they would say, yeah, we can see it too. Well, I invite you all to see this future that you can also tell. This snowball is rolling right into your future. It's going to change that which is the outcomes of the wars that you see now. It's going to change whether there's ever going to be another one. It's going to change how people think about what they're seeing now and what they might do with their leadership to prevent it from happening again all over the world, not just in one or two places. Dear ones, yes, the future can be told, your future can be told, when it's so obvious where it's going. That is the information I gave you 34 years ago. I told you that the shift was coming, and the shift would bring a difference in the planet's thinking about what they wanted. It doesn't mean everybody gets religious. It doesn't mean everybody gets enlightenment. It means that there is a, is a far sweeping, more powerful energy of compassion and kindness to one another and an idea of what you want to do while you're on the planet. Trade with each other, not war with each other. 
clean up the planet so you're not destroying it. That is actually something that is in progress. Have inventions given to you that'll stop pollution. That is in progress. All of these things in the snowball of the future that you know about. That's the answer. Yes. I'm going to talk more about time. I'm going to talk more about the future in the future channels to come. The future channels. <laughs> Do you see why I'm in love with humanity? Can you see this? I am. And for good reason. And so it is. And following that beautiful message from Cryon, who reminds us again and again that Cryon is in love with humanity. I think I speak on behalf of humanity that we are in love with Cryon. And I invite you to open your eyes. If you've had your eyes closed, bring your awareness back into your body. And our special guest, Joining us this evening really requires no introduction, but we are going to tell you about him in a little bit. His name is Mike Dooley, and I want to make sure Mike is on the Zoom feed with us. Mike, are you there? I'm here, Monica, and I'm happy. Thanks for having me. Oh, uh, uh, well, Lee and I are both super happy, super excited Absolutely. about having you with us. And you know, before I tell you more about Mike, uh, Monica and I have previously met him when we contributed to one of his online events. He's such a fun guy and we love how much he embraces channeling. That's, I guess I'm biased. It's one of the, my favorite things about him. <laughs> I'd love to tell you more about him now. Wow, Mike Dooley is a two-time New York Times best-selling author. Who, is, who has presented to his live audiences 156 cities across 42 countries. I don't know when I've had any kind of a bio where I've been able to say anything close to that. Wow. He speaks on living del deliberately and creating consciously. His free Notes from the Universe inspirational emails are sent to over 1 million people in 182 countries. Go, go work with that in your mind. Don Miguel Ruiz called him a great messenger of truth and a gift for humanity. So Mike is the author of 18 books, including Playing the Matrix, Life on Earth, Infinite Possibilities, Leveraging the Universe, and Manifesting Change. Don't you just love those titles already? I mean, every title, I'm like, oh, oh, I'm interested in that subject. So over the past Three years, Mike has led and moderated dozens of online courses at www.tut.com. He has contributed to the groundbreaking film that many of you may remember called The Secret. And Mike's been featured in major media outlets such as The New York Times, Forbes, Style Magazine, Psychology Today, BuzzFeed, 17, Teen Vogue and Yoga Digest. We are so thrilled he's joining us tonight. Mike, welcome to Healing Wednesday and tell us about your story, how this got started for you. Hey, Monica. Hey, Lee. What an honor it is to be here. And um, I feel like my life just flashed before my eyes hearing that, uh, that wonderful introduction. Thanks so much for all of this and for Cryon and uh, just the energy you both put out into the world is palpable. So such an honor to be with you. How did I get started in all of this? Um, oh, it goes way back. I, I can remember as um, you know, 12, 13 years old, kind of hitting my mom with these questions about, you know, could there really be a devil and God doesn't God love us enough and time must be illusionary. And I would ask the same questions to the priests and the nuns at the Catholic church that I would go to. And I was not a very considered a very good boy for those questions, but unbeknownst to me at the time and still true for all of us is when we have a yearning, burning desire to know truth and there is a truth. It's absolute. There's a lot of different ways to it. Uh, there's a lot of roads to Rome but none of those roads changes Rome. I, I, a side note, I really don't like it when people say everyone has their own truth. Like, no, they don't. 
There goes all your power. There is a truth. We are of the divine. Our thoughts become things. Now, there's a lot of subjectivity on the way there. We're all kind of walking each other home, as Ram Das said. But to think that truth is pliable, depending on how you define the word truth, really zaps, off, zaps us of our energy. But back on track here, uh, I used to ask these questions, and given the the law of attraction, working not just with cars and checks, but with confidence and answers, I started drawing answers to me. And by the time I was in college, almost doubled over with anxiety and wanting to know why are we here and why does everybody die? Everybody. And where do they go? What's the point? I mean, then it was really intense. At about that time, my mom while I'm a majoring in accounting and did become a CPA, um, mom started sending me these kooky books, uh, really out there stuff. She was a big reader. I was not a reader. And one of those books, she said, was channeled by this woman, Jane Roberts, who would go into a deep trance and her husband would take longhand dictation and out would pop one book after the another, another. And I remember saying, Mom, you've lost it. Uh, <laughs> and I really meant it. I really meant it. It was like, that was the most outlandish, crazy, silly, unverifiable claim I had ever heard. And she was always my guru. Um, and she shut me down and she said, forget the source. Just read what Seth has to say. And so she mailed me the book. This is before internet, you know, a long time ago. And oh my God, everything Seth said, and so much more, was stuff that confirmed my own inner suspicions. Because as I was asking these questions about the nature of reality, our identity, our power, um, I was feeling answers. It's like, you know, everything must be God. You know, Time has to be illusionary. It's all eternal. We have to be here because we wanted to be here. Because if we're eternal after the now, we're eternal before the now, so to speak, the now as defined by time and space. And so all of a sudden, I got this clarity that had not come from anywhere else. And uh, so began my inward journey. And my objective then was just to live the most amazing, wealthy, love-filled life possible. Uh, I thought that was the point of getting these answers, the point of truth. So I continued with my degree in accounting. I worked for Price Waterhouse. I traveled the world. Um, I eventually became an entrepreneur, teamed up with my brother and mother. My mom was still deeper into the woo-woo than me. My brother was uh, on board as well. And we started writing, selling t-shirts with his art and my little poems about the power of our thoughts and the beauty of life and um, picture in your mind all that you may be. And with a little time, you will come to see that in the game of life, your dreams will come alive by thinking of the end result as if it had arrived. That was one of our best selling t-shirts along with I'm too sexy for my t-shirt. And so, <laughs> Love that. <laughs> so, so for 10 years, we sold boatloads of shirts. The trends were declining. Um, at this point, 10 years into that, after six years with Price Waterhouse, I was on the cusp of 40 and starting over, didn't know what I was starting. We had a good run, but I had I still had a big mortgage. And uh, I started sending out these emails that I most wanted to receive at that low ebb in my life. I was 40. Uh, no career momentum, starting over. My girlfriend had run away with a boyfriend that wasn't me. And uh, it's as weird as it sounds. Um, and I was like so lost. It was my dark night of the soul. So I wanted to get confirmation that I'm not alone, that it's all a dream, that I can change anything uh, for the better quickly. And so I started sending out these emails to our subscriber base of 2000 people who used to get the deal of the week in the t-shirt company um, and started just making them positive, just like just just good news. There was nothing for sale. It was like Monday morning motivators. They were never really that popular, honestly, but they made possible the evolution of my writing to become notes from the universe. Uh, which you mentioned now by word of mouth has 1.2 million people subscribing every day of the week all over the world. Um, 
20 plus years of sending out notes have spun into world tours and books and really the life of my dreams. Uh, it's been absolutely amazing. And, and where I use the truth to give solace and direction to my life and find my power um, in my 20s and even in my 30s, um, by the time I got to 40, even though uh, I was not the poster child for what I taught in that glimmer of the timeline, um, I began teaching it. Uh, and then, you know, I've learned so much more. Uh, my life seemed to be a train wreck at age 40. Um, but I teach now, you know, don't go looking for what's wrong with you. Don't even assume something's wrong with you. Your, your physical senses can't see the big picture. Uh, and sure enough, instead of looking for what was wrong with me, I felt like, dang it, I know how life's work, how life works. I can't explain how I got where I am, but I can explain how to move forward. Picture in your mind the end result. Take baby steps, craft affirmations, create a visualization, have a couple of vision boards going on. And the next thing you know, I was like, oh my God, you know, having coffee in the Regent Hotel in Kowloon, Hong Kong, and there's the exact same view of Hong Kong Island that I had put on my vision board. And it was like pinching myself. And when I look back to explain the so-called train wreck, no, there was no train wreck. The, the train of my life came to a screeching halt, which is rare enough, so that it could change tracks and go better, farther, faster than it could have on the track I was on. And so within a couple of years, I was on the road touring and um, really living like I had never lived while sharing the truth about our divinity, our power, our eternal nature. And, and somewhere along the way, um, Joe Vitale became a fan of mine. He we traded audio programs. He saw ads I was running in New Age magazine for infinite possibilities. And he started talking about my work. And a fan of his was Rhonda Byrne, who reached out to me a year later and said, Mike, my sister and I are coming to the United States from Melbourne, Australia, and we're doing a documentary on the law of attraction called The Secret. We love your notes. We love infinite possibilities. Is there an opportunity where we might be able to have you for an afternoon to, to interview for the, to, to be a part of the secret? And, and so that's how I got in the secret. The miracles were happening before I even knew it. And I teach that as well. Just because you can't see um, the miracles doesn't mean you're not layered in them right now. So to draw the conclusion that something's wrong, I'm doing it wrong, it's, uh, it's not right, it must be karma, bogus, bogus, just stay on point. And thy will shall be done. I love how you <laughs> not just embrace affirmations, but because we love affirmations yeah. and it creates things that you can't see possibly, but you know it's there and then you step into it. I have a question and, and it might not be in your field. So don't feel like it's an ambush question, but in your conversation, I'm curious because in our world where we see a lot of things happen and unfold, and it could be even in your own community and you see something in the family unfolds, a situation where it's disaster. How do we get through, because we're empaths, creating what we want with the vision board and then not feeling guilty that we have such unimaginable happiness <laughs> and we have someone close to us it that doesn't. doesn't, and mm -hmm. they're in drama, and, and it's almost like, you know, survival guilt when you're in a car crash, mm -hmm. and you survive, and the other people you love did not, and you have you carry that survival guilt. So how do you carry the mm -hmm. guilt of happiness <laughs> when everyone around you great, is unhappy? Great question. Uh, I, I've been there, and I so can relate to that, Monica, really uh, piercing question. I'll share that when one gets to that place of milk and honey and land of your wildest dreams, you have a, such a sense of appreciation that as you gaze back into your past and maybe even glimpse that 
dark night of the soul, you feel nothing but gratitude because every single moment and every player and every offense and every insult made possible the person you became and the heights you've attained. And you wouldn't trade it for anything. Although at first glance, without a little bit of simmering into the truth and dwelling and asking great questions, it feels like, oh man, like uh, what did I do to deserve so much? I, I was lost and confused and I badmouthed my my life and I complained to my mother. And I, I mean, that was me. I was like, I was negative, 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 but I still did enough to be positive. And it doesn't take much. Five minutes of positivity will offset 17 hours of fear and worry. That's a tangent. But when you get to that place and you realize how grateful you are for all the knocks and falls, you realize that your arrival was not only ultimately inevitable, such as the nature of the expansion of the universe through every single one of us, it came here to thrive and it's gonna get its job done in every guise, behind every pair of eyes, just as you needed and in a deep level wanted to be driven through the murk and the mire, to be tested and called higher, to go within and find your might, so is that what your beloveds who are not yet where you are going through now. That's where they are. And just as you most wanted it at a really deep level so that you could be called higher by yourself and find that power, that's exactly what they're being called to do. And just as inevitable as it is and was for you to arrive, so is it for them they can't not get there, but they're going on a different path to Rome and their path will lead them to Rome. And on their path, you can love them and you can understand and you can sympathize and you can hold their hand. But, but when you have this new perspective and you realize that it's playing out perfectly, just beyond, beyond anything a human mind could grasp, you can kind of exhale and, and your confidence, your peace of mind, your occasional reassurances to the degree they allow you is going to help them weather that storm and they will prevail and they will bask in your light. And part of the reason perhaps the two of you chose to be together was so that you maybe with more incarnations and experience could be that light. So it's all playing out perfectly. And it would only slow things down if you played the pity party with them. Like, oh, I'm so sorry to hear that. And yeah, that's not fair. It's like, oh, don't, not that your enlightened audience would do that, but it's like, you know, don't try to understand it right now. It's playing to your greater good. Everything in time and space plays to your greater good. Everything in time and space was orchestrated by the divine with your intentions, with your changing perspectives, with your evolving and ascending mind. And so trust it. It's going to play out so well. I, I can think of so many. Well, I was dateless and lonely so much of my life. I didn't get married till I was 50. Um, and, and it wasn't until then when I looked back at, at the many failed relationships that I just was like, thank God I escaped with my life. They were not even that good, but they were all I knew at the time. And it's like, man, it made possible where I am and who I'm with now. I'm laughing because I, I you know, we've been there as well. And Everything that happens is because it's a stepping stone to stepping into the greater you. I always like mm -hmm. the, uh, the way it's been described to me, too, is you, you ever have a situation where you've uh, climbed a mountain or something and there's a lot of switchbacks and you get higher and higher and you look down and you watch the people who are doing the same thing you did and you say, wow, I wish I could bring them up here because, wow, they'd see it right now. Nope, they've got to do the switchbacks just like I did. But they're on the path. Yeah. Yeah, that's such a good analogy. And it's going to be so much sweeter when they get there. They're inevitably going to get there. Um, 
And knowing this and and being a reassuring light to them, uh, maybe an example, a brotherly type of example, uh, we can still leave room to you know encourage them and have them probe and ask some new questions and you know get them on the path. I keep taking those steps. You don't know how close you are. Everything changes for the better in an instant. Truth, truth, truth. If you're taking steps, so you know. We're all helping each other. You guys help me. And so uh, I think that's the the gift in having friends who may not be quite where you are yet um, that, that you can, you know, facilitate it and reassure and make a difference. Mike, you've been doing this a long time. You, you teach, I know, uh, so many people and, and you've, you've got such great messages. And there's one thing. We run up against all the time. There'll be somebody, if not everybody, who at some level say, I don't think I deserve it. And they say, well, um, this is, I've got, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? That there the is good a, stuff? Yeah. Yeah, there's that self-worth. Yeah. There is a, oh. no, that's not for me. I don't think so. Uh, there's something. Well, we're all acclimating to that. And we're coming from very primitive times. We're still immersed in very primitive times most of the world right now and so yeah there's that old guilt that christian guilt and put the needs of others before your own and how dare you ask for this but part of our ascension part of our learning part of our enlightenment is realizing that all of us are born deserving of whatever we want and more what we want is what the divine most wants for us it's just a matter of jockeying it into our lives with all of our other desires and whatever whatever other pillars we put in the way or bars behind invisible limiting beliefs. But part of the learning and part of the uh, acceleration comes as, as we work with those beliefs and just literally think them out loud or write them down. You know, am I worthy? Of course I'm worthy. Like Khalil Gibran said, you know, everyone is worthy of the, the fruit from the apple tree. It does not ask, have you been good? Did you work hard today? Beggar or saint, or sinner or saint, they can all have the apples. And if your apples are symbolic of a million dollars, that's not coming from anyone else. You can manifest your million dollars. Go for it. You'll be an example to others who get it. And when you work on seeing things in a new and improved light, uh, where, the, where you recognize it's all illusions, you know, it's just a holographic universe and that I can gain without other people having to, to lose because that's the old paradigm where, you know, we live in this duality. And for me to get more coconuts on the island, somebody has to have fewer coconuts. But that's living on your physical senses alone. And it's not OK to live on your physical senses alone. That's what we're learning right now. So. I think we all need to work with ourselves. I certainly have, as I shared, like whatever did I do to deserve so much? I was negative. I badmouthed life. I said, where's the damn universe? Where's the flipping magic? Um, but I also did what I could with what I had. Some visualizations, some baby steps, made some cold calls, did some awkward stuff. Like, you know, I don't really... I don't really want to get in front of an audience. I don't want to join Toastmasters. Do it anyway. And so I pushed myself um, where there was some resistance, um, you know, because there was a deeper part of me that said, go, this is you, this is you, man. This, you got to deal with that irrational fear of speaking in public, but I don't want to just shut up and go. So while I would worry, uh, I would still take action. And it just takes a little bit of positivity, as I said, to offset a day's worth of negativity because our inclination, our inborn inclination is to thrive and to prosper. We are sparks of God that came here to rock and roll. And so you think a thought in alignment with rocking the world in a glorious, loving, joyful way, that goes with the currents. Like, hell yeah, given your divine lineage, when you think, I'm stupid, I'm dumb, it probably won't happen. It's very difficult for those kind of thoughts to become the things and events of our lives because they go totally against the current of truth, the truth that brought you here. Now, we can make anything happen, painful as well, but if we understand our inclination to thrive, it only takes that little bit of positivity, including showing up in the world, 
knocking on doors, pressing the flash, making the cold calls for total transformation when we are consistent and grounded in truth. Beautiful. Amen. So I agree good. with you all of that. You ought to write a book. Yeah. I mean, you know. Yeah, you should write a book. <laughs> <laughs> I have a quick question, and it's about those who are tuning in and listening to it and might, n might be new to all of this. How do we get clear on finding out what we want? Because I think that's, if you ask people, what do you mm. want? That's sometimes the hardest thing to answer. Those who are we, very clear and know what they want can go about achieving it and getting it. How do you get clear to find yeah. out what do I want? Yeah, well, here you go. Um, we mess with the shoulds and we mess with the hows and we mess with the whos and the whens so much. We've been taught to be micromanagers and we bring that over into the game of manifestation. We want to micromanage that house with that kitchen on that hill with that partner. And it's like, it doesn't work like that. We need to have general big pictures in our mind and results. I want abundance. I want a rocking home life. I want family and friends. Visualize details to get excited about them. Let go of the details and then take steps in the direction of generalities. As to the question of like, what is my purpose and how do I sink my teeth into something when nothing really excites me? You're so desensitized from trying to micromanage too much, you no longer know. Sometimes the big picture, okay, I want career fulfillment. I don't know what that is, but I want career fulfillment. Sometimes the big picture will at least get you moving in that direction. And then what I suggest, okay, you're moving towards maybe the arts, or maybe you're moving towards entrepreneurhood, or maybe you're, or entrepreneurship, whatever the word is. So at least now you've got some direction. I'm sure that the road you're on is not the road you're going to arrive on. The road you start out on is not the road you arrive on. People are waiting for the road that they're going to arrive on to show up at their front door. It doesn't work like that. When I get GPS navigation to Miami, it puts me on the wrong road, road after road after road that does not lead to Miami. I live in Orlando. But the roads that it does put me on, taking into account traffic, construction, detours, and all else, is calculated to get me to the future roads that will arrive in South Beach. And in life, it's exactly the same. So you don't know what your passion is. You don't know what most lights you up. You don't know where to begin. Begin anywhere. You've programmed transformation or joy or financial abundance or a rocking career. That's all the universe needs. It knows the details better than you. Incidentally, it's good to visualize details when you know what they are, maybe the bling, maybe the luxury, maybe a hand to hold, because that helps you feel emotionally excited about the transformation you're headed to. But we don't attach to the bling. We don't attach to the person. We don't attach to a path because that path may never go there. But we attach to the ultimate desired transformation area or theme that we want in our lives. And then we get busy doing what we can with what we have. I, I frame it like this on the sucky roads before us, choose the least sucky. Now you've got some traction and the sucky roads, the dirt roads will lead to the diamond mine. Beautiful. Well, if you are excited about all the things Mike is sharing with us, why wouldn't you be? Uh, <laughs> I'd like to, again, let you know about the website, which is www.tut.com. That's an acronym for, I think, uh, think. The Universe Talks. Talks. Yeah. Right. yeah. Uh, talk. The Universe the Talks. Universe yeah. Talks. I love it. Yay. The Universe yeah. Talks. Tut.com. So, it's been so wonderful hearing all that. I want to know if there's any kind of final pieces of advice that you want to share with our community. Sure. Well, beyond happy holidays and happy new year, I should say, um, you know, I, the one um, formula that explains where we each individually fit into the equation of reality creation is thoughts become things 
could not ever overplay that, could not ever overstate that. It's the end all and be all, not God, your God, not destiny, not karma, not ancient spiritual contracts. All of those can be overridden by ourselves, changing our mind, driven by desire, um, and aligning our words and behavior with those thoughts. So thoughts become things, the floodgates begin to tremble. And, and, and if I may add a brief little footnote to that, enjoy every flipping moment. Because I even now I look back on those scared days when I was turning 40 years old from this perspective, and I'm like, uh, those are some of my most cherished memories, the dark night of the soul. I'm like, oh, Mike, you just hang in there, little Mike. You can do it, little Mike. Oh, there's so much support around you, little Mike. You can't see it, but where I am now, oh, my God, you would wait a thousand lifetimes for how sweet it is where you're going in this lifetime. So just enjoy the moment. Don't be living for the future. Program your life's unfolding through desires and uh, themes and end results as I've been sharing. But once you put it out to the universe, it's got its marching orders. Now do everything you can to enjoy every moment of every day. It's all a gift. You have been such a gift for us. Thank you, Mike. Thank you. What thank a you, nice thank gift. You. It's a great way to start this new year. Yes. Wow. <laughs> thank you, Lee. Thank you, Monica. Wow. Well, thoughts become things. If you learned nothing else from this conversation, <laughs> take do. that with you. Thoughts mm -hmm. become things. We're going to take a break and then we'll see you back here for the Circle of Twelve.
Hey, welcome back, everybody. And that was wonderful with Mike Dooley. What a treasure. Absolutely. And I love wow. the very three impactful words, thoughts become things. And I'll tell you, that whole um, idea, that principle of the, you can create your own reality and thoughts become things, that was laughed at. Um, when I started channeling, I remember the, the, that very premise being presented, and people thought it was just stupid. <laughs> and now here we are, 30 years later, and it's almost mainstream. I think part of that was uh, caused by the secret. And thank you, Mike, for all that you do and have being part of such a wonderful project. Absolutely. It's a wonderful reminder again, thoughts become things. And how Cryon says is that consciousness is energy. And so we can use our consciousness to send energy. What I'd like to do now is move into a part of the program we call Miracle Moments. It's about celebrating the miracles of others, and it's about connecting and sending love and compassion to those who are asking for a miracle. I want you to know that the energy of compassion and prayer for others is powerful. Group prayer works. Many of our members have told us about the miracles that they have received. I'd like to ask Monica to share a miracle moment, which happened to two of our Circle of Twelve members. So I have two miracle moments to share this evening, and they came from Italy. They were shared to me by our Cryon Italian team, Luca and Julia. And Luca and Julia, we love you. You do such a wonderful job in bringing Healing Wednesday to our Italian family. And actually, we have many wonderful teams that translate Healing Wednesday into Spanish, Portuguese, German, and Hebrew. But back to the miracle moments. The first miracle happened to Irene. And Irene says, I went to the dentist for a small procedure on a tooth and the dentist told me, let's start working and if it hurts too much, we will stop and do some anesthesia. I then remembered what Lee Carroll said about his surgery. I spoke with Innate and my cells, explaining that the dentist's work and tools were being used to restore the tooth to its shape so that it could carry out its function for a long time to come. It was a wonderful experience. I could feel the work being done, but without any kind of annoying sensation. I didn't even feel the sensation of cold water or air when washing and drying the area. I was in this place of peace and serenity where my cells were dancing with the tools and all the other things the dentist was using. The most wonderful part is that this experience made me realize that this works for me too and not just for others as I tended to think before. I have such immense gratitude to Cryon and Lee. Oh, thank you, Irene. And this second miracle moment comes from Elisabetta. And Elisabetta says, I want to share my successes so that they can help other people. About two years ago, I listened to Cryon talk about innate and that we are the commanders of our own biology. Due to an emotional shock from when I was fired and lost my job, my blood sugar rose to a very high level in the morning on an empty stomach. Not even the medicine the doctor gave me could bring it back to a normal level. So much so that I stopped taking the medicine. Instead, I started talking to my innate and sending love to my cells, asking to normalize the situation. After about three months, my blood sugar level dropped back to normal without any medicine, and it continues to remain stable even today. Thanks to all of you, and thank you for sharing those wonderful examples of how powerful we are. And I hope all of you paid attention that both of these examples were to show you that you can do this as well. It's not just for others. So what I'd like to do now is to send energy of love and compassion to all those who have requested our help. So it's so easy to do this. 
I invite you to close your eyes and to focus on the area of your heart. And as you focus on the area of your heart, I invite you to relax your breathing, breathing nice deep breaths slowly in through the nose, out through your mouth. And continue focusing on the area of your heart. And as we focus on that area of the heart, let us feel, sense, imagine or visualise the cells of our heart dancing to the song of love, gratitude, appreciation and compassion. And so just continue to feel, sense, imagine, visualize the area of your heart. Visualize, feel, sense, imagine the cells of your heart vibrating and dancing to the song of love, compassion, gratitude, appreciation. And as we continue focusing on the area of our heart, we create a coherence of energy between all of us. And from this place, we are now moving in a beautiful rhythm of love, dancing to the music of unconditional love and compassion. And just like music, the notes that are played can float through the air and be transmitted to those around the musician. Let us now feel, sense, imagine or visualise the dancing cells of our heart now floating out into the air and those frequencies, those notes, those vibrations are now being felt and perceived by those around us. And because we are many on this planet, and because there is a quantum energy that surrounds us, these notes and music and vibrations and frequencies of the song of love is now being transmitted to all of those who are requesting help from us. And it's also being transmitted to those who are requesting a miracle to happen for them. It could be a synchronicity. It could be emotional healing. It could be a physical healing. But right now they are being bathed in a flood of music and dancing of joy, happiness and gratitude. And so let us hold this energy, this frequency of love, as we move across and welcome Cryon. Greetings, dear ones. I am Cryon. Come a little closer. This is the circle of 12. And I've said before, it really doesn't have anything to do with 12 of anything. It is a metaphor for the structure of all things. Everything is based in 12 or segments of 12 in the universe. This structure is where we take you. We take you to a journey to visit your own soul. That has been the premise of the circle of 12 ever since we began. But more than a premise and more than an exercise, more than a, than a working meditation, it has an element of reality that we told you from the beginning that we expect you to discover. It's a funny word, expect you. Usually we'd say, we invite you to discover. Now we expect you to discover it. And the reason is because it's there. It's before you. If I invited you to see something when I turned on the light, 
That wouldn't really be the word, would it? I expect you to see something when we turn on the light. If it's there, you'll see it. I expect you to feel the reality of what we do next. What has happened in three to four decades of human consciousness is a gradual evolvement. An evolvement in all areas, but the one that is the most profound is the spiritual one. The one that sees an answer to who am I? It's the one that, that sees magnificence where before there was victimization. Now that's a big statement, but it's true. There are so many asking the questions, what's next? Who am I? What's this all about? And receiving answers. Instead of wringing their hands, thinking they have nothing to do with anything and, and, and what's going to happen next, there are those who are actually understanding and seeing the reality of the energy they have as pieces of God that they are. There is divinity in all of you. We're going to cross the bridge yet again, as we always do. We're going to go into that beautiful area, this, this first meeting of the year, as we always have, and invite you once again to feel, could this be real? To feel the answer to that question, could this be real? A reality that is perhaps different from the one that you grew up in, the one you walk around in, but it's real nonetheless. Is it possible that there are levels of reality? And the answer is, oh, yes. Is it possible there are multidimensionalities, experiences that are yours, that are every bit as real as the one that you experience walking around in 4D? And the answer is yes. I wish you could ask the shamans of old and their cosmology. Tell me about the levels of reality and they would start in and they would give you a walkthrough of how they've been to many of them and come back with information from all of them. I would like to take you to another reality. It is your soul. It's across that bridge. Come, take my hand. Walk with me. Hold my hand. As we walk across this bridge representing a place you know to a place you don't know. And even those who have been with us from the beginning and have crossed this uh, over a hundred times, you still don't know what's there. You only experience a touch of it, a piece of it. But that piece is always some of the most beautiful experiences you could have human being come with me now across the middle of the bridge that obfuscates what's what's the the destination and as you cross this bridge come into the light a beautiful light that is not necessarily brighter than you have seen before it's just more magnificent than you've seen before come with me from black and white to color come with me where everything you see has life and dances before you whether it's, whether it's the grass or the ground or the sky, it all knows you, greets you, and says, welcome back. And here you are. Walk with me through that, that beautiful doorway that has your name on it that says, we invite you to still another experience. Come with me. Come on in. Again, come to a, a very large place with a chair where you're going to be administered to. It's about time. Again, we go to a situation where there will be one or more angelic beings from an angelic realm, you might say, which is only to say they're just like you, only they're on this side of the veil, my side of the veil. The one that's least understood, the one that you say has angels. And we say, 
friends. Sit down in that chair, be ready. Because here comes the angel who I will say is absolutely nameless, but humans want to name them all. It's interesting because after you've named the angel, it'll go away, it'll come back and you'll name it something else <laughs> because the angel never looks the same. This is multidimensionality at its best. Here comes this beautiful angel and it greets you. It comes before you as you sit there and it kneels down. Isn't this interesting? Takes your hands and says, welcome home. Good to have you back, if even for a few minutes. It's great to have you back. And you recognize not just the majesty, but the friendliness, the camaraderie of this beautiful friend, Angel. The angel stands and begins to paint pictures in the sky, you might say, or around you of something very specific for you to see. And then you realize what this angel is doing. The whole purpose is to show you the future. It's a generic kind of future, not a specific one. The angel paints civilizations that are smiling. The angel paints the future of earth. The angel paints skies which are not polluted. The angel paints for you the evolving joy of humanity. A joy that comes from no starvation. A joy that comes from no war. A joy that comes to having figured out how different cultures can live with one another with totally different ideas. I, I mean, even ideas about God. They figured it out. A culture that has an allowance of belief for another culture. Those are the pictures that are painted in the air before you. The angel of the future, you might say, is telling you it's going to be different than you think, dear ones. Do not stress or worry about what is coming for this planet because you are here to help at difficult times. And then the angel paints a picture of you and, and it shocks you and surprises you. You recognize it, but you don't recognize it. You really don't. And this, this may not sit well with many of you, but the, the picture is of a child. And it's not you as a child. It's you in the future as a child. And then the angel goes further and paints children from the child. And that'd be your children. And the angel sits back and says, this is your legacy. You will begin it this time in this lifetime and you will be enjoying it the next time and the next time and the next time. All this the angel is showing you is the evolution of the consciousness of this planet to a place you don't expect where humanity eventually understands joy, compassion, and the absolute need for some of these things like kindness and allowance and the realization that you're all the same. At the core level, you all have this same kind of soul. If I said it was the same soul, you wouldn't like that. But in a multidimensional way, it is. You come home and home is the same culture the sacred one, this one that you're visiting now, the one that greets you unconditionally and says, welcome home. But on earth, it's changing. And you may say to yourself, well, it doesn't look too good right now. And the angel knows what you're thinking and says, welcome to a planet you have asked to be on that's in trouble because it's in correction 
because it is eliminating dark, because it is waking up, because it is becoming colorful from black and white, because it is changing in a way that is exceptionally difficult. It's a change of consciousness and it may take generations and you will be here when it does. That's what the angel is saying. And you may even be so bold as to say to the angel, well, this is so, this is wonderful, but how about me? How about my future? Right now, what's gonna happen to me? And the angel looks at you and smiles and holds your hands and say, picture all things beautiful. And the angel looks at you and says, promise me, picture in your mind all things beautiful beautiful and then put you at the center of it and it will happen that way because you are powerful human being it's time you realized it relax 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 and be loved this is the future for you for humanity It's what you think that then becomes the reality. That's the energy of consciousness that is love. Thank you, human, for crossing this bridge with me to hear these words about how magnificent you are and how much hope there is for all that is coming. Thank you, human being, for enduring ugly things and darkness and spreading the light where you can and being patient while you do. I am crying in love with humanity. And so it is.